Welcome to Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco, bringing you interviews with industry experts and regular folks who tested the job search waters and succeeded, and strategies to tell your story and land your job interviews in 60 days, guaranteed. Here's your host, Virginia Franco. Hello, everyone. I have with me today uh, global talent management strategist, coach, and trainer, Dorothy Dalton. She is the CEO of 3 Plus International and DDTM and works globally in talent management strategy, covering the whole spectrum from hire to retire in the talent pipeline. She's recruited, trained, and coached thousands of men and women in her career, working with with renowned international companies and organizations. Her firm provides HR consulting to organizations that are looking to create diverse and inclusive diverse and inclusive workplaces, including gender balance, focus on bias, conscious talent sourcing, and retention. She is very heavily involved in HR and tech, and particularly with regards to potential changes to recruitment process processes. Uh, and lastly, she is a keynote speaker, a trainer, an author, HR blogger. Um, I know her from LinkedIn. Um, so Dorothy, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very delighted to be here. And especially because it's, uh, I'm in the U.S., Dorothy is in Belgium, so she is calling me in the evening, which I very much appreciate. You're very welcome. I'm very happy to be here. So you heard me give a quick overview of, you know, you heard the bio that I used to introduce you. I'd love to hear from you if there's anything that I missed in terms of the services that you provide. And then I'd love to hear how you came to be in, you know, came to be the CEO of two different companies. Um, well, basically, I've, I've, I've got two, two different um, HR consulting organizations, one that is gender neutral. And the other one, which focuses primarily on the female talent pipeline. So I'm, I support organizations that are looking to bring in greater diversity and greater gender balance into their organizations and also to help women um, achieve their potential. How, what was it? How, you know, it sounds like you're passionate about this. Tell me how you came to, to found these companies. Well, I was, my early career was in corporate HR, and I think like a lot, a lot of people who, who do this, and I, I, I had a period in European sales and marketing, and way back, way back when, many years ago, I had an opportunity to go set, my, set up my own business and go into a, a primarily executive search. So okay. the main focus of my business is, is executive search, but for my early career, I was a, a trained I was a a coach and a trainer, and that sort of came back, um, I would say, at the height of the the big financial crisis. when I Back in 2008? Yeah, 2008, yeah. And when a lot of people were looking for coaching, and it it, it was only then that I added it to as a a potential offering. And I came into the, the gender balance world Basically, when my daughter um, graduated from university and I found that she was encountering 30 years after me exactly the same issues that I had in the workplace. Really? Uh, I'm sadly, yes. So oh. that, that's, how I, that's how 3 Plus came in, into, into being, was that I, I got involved in, with my daughter and her friends and eventually... It became it became a business. So, um, and we're still not making the sort of progress I'd like to see. But um, that's a little bit of my history. Wow. Well, I want to focus. Given that you have this insight into gender biases and you know your work to try to achieve balance on that, I'd love to get your thoughts through the questions that we will discuss. Um, you know, you went through it 30 years ago, your daughter did, and now you've been coaching women across all industries, I imagine. Um, what are a couple of the challenges that you see women facing that are making career change or, or trying to look for a job for, um, you know, maybe for the first time in a while? I, I think 
I think some of the challenges for women, I think particularly for those that have taken time out maybe to um, do a parenting gap, um, mm-hmm. I, think, I think that can be very challenging for some women. I think a lot of women lose confidence in that period. And I think there have been a lot of changes that have taken place, as you know. And one of, one of the hardest things is trying to understand if you've taken even four or five years out or even less, um, that it's quite hard to keep, to keep up with the pace of change that we've seen in the job search market. So that's, yeah. that's the first thing. And the second thing is that most women, uh, when I say they're blissfully unaware, I mean, in some ways, it's a good thing that they don't realize that the biases that they have to encounter when they're looking for a job. So uh, it's quite interesting when I do workshops or I, I do keynotes or whatever it is, and we're talking about the challenges, the invisible challenges that women face both, you know, breaking into the workplace, staying in it, and then what happens when they, if they take a break to have a family. So it, it's, um, the workplace for a woman is very different experience to the workplace for a man. Than it is for a man. Do you sense that, when you say that women are blissfully unaware, or do you feel like that is occurring more for the women that have left? Or even people that are currently in the workforce, they really don't recognize what they're going to be facing should they take a gap or, or maybe it's even challenges of, of staying in the workforce. I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's like with everything, it's very nuanced. So it, it's, it's a mix of both. So, I mean, we, women don't understand, for example, how um, the research from the European Commission so it gives it, um, shows how women are judged by their appearance far more heavily than, than men are and how um, priority is given to their flexibility and whether or not they have children. Whereas for men, it's, it's attached to their qualifications and experience, which is completely yeah. the normal thing. That's exactly how it should be. So women have got a lot of double, a lot of double binds. And the other thing that they face is when they stand up for themselves and they, they try and make a correction that they quite often have the backlash of, you know, they're, they're difficult or they're emotional or, you know, they're aggressive. I mean, that, that's very common right. for women. Yeah, so no, you're right. And, and those same qualities when they come out in a man are, are, are admired versus... Yeah, the leadership qualities, right? The leadership qualities, that's right. So when, when women... They're not viewed as leadership. <laughs> yeah, then, then it's considered you know, to be you know, not appropriate or not leadership material. So there's great research from um, Harvard Business Review on that, about the words that are used to describe women, for example, in performance reviews. I know, yep. No, have I have studied that? that. Yeah, I um, have. It's, it's, it's very eye-opening. Um, so do you teach women how to navigate those waters? Are you trying to empower them to fight back more? What would you say? Um, it, well, what I try and do is both, right? And in, in the sense okay. that I'm um, part of me is a realist in the sense that women have to learn how to navigate. Um, but the part of me is also focusing on trying to get workplaces to change and become more inclusive. Right. So I'm working on, on the two elements. On both ends. Yeah. And that's what we really so- need to be doing. We do. No, you're right. I have two daughters. Uh, yeah, it's, just, it, it's heartbreaking to think that, that we haven't moved the needle much. Um, yeah. What do you find? Is there something that, that you find that just utterly shocks some of the clients that you're, that you're working with, with regards to this or just job search in general? Um. I think it's one of those things that um, quite often women don't ask for help in job search. I don't know if it's the same in the States. I think in the States, you're much, you have a culture that is much more open to investing in professional services. So that's when I say that Europe is a step behind, this is one area where the, huh. we are a step behind. So usually, Yeah, I would say probably half of my clients are women. That's yeah, interesting, I but I don't, you know, and that's yeah. anecdotal. I don't know if, if that's a cultural norm or I'm lucky. I don't know. Um, I, think, I think in the States, it's much more common. In Europe, women tend to seek help when they are desperate. 
when they're, they're on burnout um, or yeah. something terrible has happened. They have, they're in a toxic workplace or they have a difficult boss or there is some major issue that it is only then that they seek help. Um, whereas so like, last, in, absolute last, they're desperate for help. Yeah. What, what happens in the state? It's, it's much more routine, I think. I think so. It, um, yeah, I, it never even occurred to me. I actually would have said that men are more reluctant to seek help for what I offer. I mean, you know, I offer writing services. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'd say I'm my, my clientele are about 50-50. Um, I do see, I do, you know, some of the points that you brought up around, um, you, you know, how people fight back and how people are judged by their parents, you know, all of those things I definitely see. But in terms of people seeking help, um, I don't feel like I, I have seen a, a tendency one way or the other. I'd love to look, poll some people about that, though. Yeah, I, I, I think, I could, well, this is my experience, that, that women mm-hmm. come when they're desperate. When you know that that's the point of no, re- you know they're really yeah. at, at the last resort. Whereas yeah. men, their hair, their hair is on fire. <laughs> they're much more strategic about their career. They're planning. They're networking externally, um, and and they tend to have a, a, a longer term vision. And certainly the, the work that um, Three Plus did in in the MBA community, for example, showed there were differences between. Um, having a, women not having a career strategy and men having a career strategy. And that was a clear differentiator be, between men and women. It's quite interesting. That is interesting. Um, yeah, I would... So you're, in your experience, women tend not to have a career strategy or... Yeah. Yeah. They do. Yeah. I, I would... I could, yeah, I concur with that. Um, I, you know, I consider myself an accidental entrepreneur. I don't know that I had any big plan. Um, and I would probably say I'm not alone. Um, so what advice would do you give women when they are looking to, you know, it's one thing to look for a job. It's another thing to try to make a career change or a career move. Um, is there advice that you would give, you know, give a woman as a job seeker that maybe is a little different than you do with your other clients or, um, or just generally speaking, what would you say to them in terms of getting started? I, th- I think my general advice is gender neutral. <clears throat> um, I, I think that everyone, if they're making a career pivot or a change or making a career decision, is that they have to look at their goals, their values, and their vision. I mean, what is important to them? What are their expectations? What are they looking for? And if they find that they're not spending time doing something that is not in line with their goals and their vision, that either their behavior has to change, their activities have to change, or their goals have to change. And and I find that men and women are equally, um, this is a gender neutral path. Mm -hmm. I think what happens in my experience is that women tend to factor in um, non-professional circumstances more heavily than men. That's my experience. So they, they will take into consideration family circumstances, um, um, what's going on with the kids, that, you know, the parents. Yeah. And yeah. Other yeah. How does it work with the balance? Yeah. And, and I mean, I, as in my role as a headhunter, um, I, I would contact a man, for example, for maybe an international opportunity because I work internationally. And mm-hmm. just say, yeah, I'm interested. Whereas a woman <laughs> would say, yeah, I need to talk about that. With Let you. me, yeah. Um, so your advice is, you know, consider, look at the long, the long view, look at the goals, the visions, the expectations, see where there's a gap and consider your change from there. Um, it's interesting because the, I would say that the younger, now I work with all generations, but the, younger generations than me. I'm a Gen X person. I would say millennials. I actually do hear more thought around the family as a component, a decision-making component for jobs. I'm tired of traveling. It's hard with my kids. They're still in grade school. I, they need me more. Um, I don't know that I hear that as much. Well, I, 
I don't hear that as much with my older clients. Maybe it's because their children are older, but I definitely am seeing that more in more recent years than when I first started writing. I, I think when my, my kids are millennials, right? So um, mm-hmm. one of the things that we tend to forget is millennials are now having kids and they've got mortgages. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we tend to make this broad brush statement about millennials without actually and you can. Yeah. what they're doing. So I think, um, and, and that's quite interesting in terms of, of recruiting older workers, is that older workers actually tend to perhaps in some areas, to have less responsibilities than, than younger workers. That's right. Workers, That's right. Younger yeah. Workers. What I am seeing, and I'm loving this, and this is happening in Europe, I don't know if it's happening in the, in the States, is that men equally want to spend more time with their families. Well, and that, um, that is my observation, and they are taking their family, they're, 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 they're evaluating their life outside of work. Yeah. when making decisions around their, their professional lives. I love yeah. it too. Um, I, find, I find that uh, it, it, I'm, I'm sitting back and watching it as, as, a, as a, if you like, a sociological change and, it, and, it, and it's mm-hmm. quite interesting. And then, then you see older generations are freed up to, you know, to work, you know, antisocial hours or to travel to strange places or do these things. And, and I think organizations should really tap into that. So I don't get why organizations have age bias. I just don't get it. I don't either. I don't either. It seems like it, there's, there's, so many, there's so many positives to bringing on older people. Like, and flexibility is one of them. You're right. They can absolutely jump from country to country and they're willing to do it. Um, where, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, uh, People that were were uh, baby boomers would not would have gone anyway, and then the family would have been miserable. But now people are taking in, men and women are taking into account the children and the family and all of that. Um, so the next thing I want to talk to you about is what advice what do you what advice do you have for people that are have been job searching and it is not going well. Because that's quite different than the person who is getting ready to embark on a job search. Um, do you do you have different advice to them to get started? Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I think this is something that, that we both see a lot on LinkedIn. And I, I think that quite often, if someone hasn't looked for a job for maybe four or five years, then the mm-hmm. pace of change that we're experiencing is so great that they, they are generally not familiar with how it works. Yeah, and they're lost. Have you found that? And so that's where I, I would say that, you know, if, if, if you can afford it, um, get some professional help because job search is not a science, right? So the art is telling a compelling narrative. And you're a writer, so you know that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And then the science side is making sure that you're searchable and retrievable. So and a, a lot of job seekers don't understand that, so they, 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 they get it wrong. So I would say to any job seeker, keep meticulous records and really track um, your success and where you're going wrong. So are you not getting called for interview? Are you not getting hits on your profile? Are you not? Are you failing at the first screening telephone or video? Are you? Um, are you? You know, maybe underperforming an interview, and really look at where you, you're you're maybe falling down, and take yeah where, where the breaks are happening. And the you're right by keeping track, you can identify where in the process where the process is breaking. Yeah, and some some people, for example, if they haven't looked for a job, they they don't have a LinkedIn profile. Well, you and I both know that that's not going to work today. Right. So, right. Um, it, it's about um, sometimes no news is news. It's new. It's the the message that you've got to do something. Um, so I would urge anybody who gets stuck with nothing, you know, and we call the cyber black hole, right? Um, yeah. And to get professional help because a lot of people who are coming to the job market, they haven't looked for a job for a while. They do what we call spray and pray. Do you have that expression? In the yep. Show? Yep. Same. So <laughs> spray and pray. And does not work. It doesn't work. No, exactly. 
I love, I don't think I've ever heard it articulated quite that way that uh, job search is a, is a true blend of art and science um, because you can have the most compelling narrative, but if you're not searchable, you're not retrievable, it's not going to work. And likewise, if you pop up on searches, but your story doesn't make any sense or it's not compelling, you won't get anywhere either. So it's really, it really does, that blend does need to happen. Yeah, exactly. So my next question is one that I, I deal with all the time. Um, and I'm sure you come across this. Pe- I, I, end up, I, I end up trying to help people who they have a lot of different skills. They can go in a number of different directions. And they are so excited to test the waters and try, well, I, I want to try this. I want to try that. I, do, I don't want to limit my options. Um, how do you help position them or how do you help them to manage that, that expectation? I, I think, I think one of the things that I do is I sit down and, and really work through what, um, you know, I use the expression goals, values and vision. What are your goals? What do you want from life? Um, what are your strengths? What are your personal development needs? What are you looking for? And in my experience, I found that people actually don't have as many options as they think they do. And there will be certain practical elements that limit, you know, like geography or the language skill. And in Europe, so I'm talking Europe, right? So um, because I'm I'm based in Brussels and you can go 200 kilometers in any direction, you need different languages. So there are things like language skills, the geography, you know, where your kids are, do you have to put them in a different education system? So all of these things. And mainly people have about four or five options. And I'm very much a plan A, B and C kind of girl, but I, I think you should follow your dream. I think I'm also, I think that, but I also think that you should have a plan B and C. And so I usually advise um, clients to research all options. And normally when they're researching and they're trying out, they, they will get different messages, which give them clearer, clearer direction. Clarity. Yeah. So if they have four or five options after you've helped to narrow it down, um, do you sort of have them go through and say, okay, the dream is plan A. And then B and C are the other options. Yeah, and 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 okay. look, look look at look at them um, and see how they align with with what you're looking for. Sometimes it might be they need to upskill, or they might have to mm-hmm. move internationally, or they have to move geographically, um, and or maybe they have to bring families with them. And I, I've been in situations where people have found their dream jobs, and then one of their teenagers won't move. And, right. and, you know, literally that there's been a lot of negotiation and compromise around, around that. So I think, it's, um, I think it's about keeping an open mind, exploring your options, and then making strategic decisions based on those. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. I laugh. My family moved, over, uh, moved from the U.S. to Mexico when I was a kid, and I <laughs> it made my parents' life a living hell. Um, to the point where they did end up moving a year earlier than the assignment. I was so miserable and I made them pay for it, which is not very, I was in middle, I was 12 going on 13. Okay. Okay. Not an ideal age. Yeah. I was a brat about it. So um, I didn't want to move. (laughs) So, well, and and I think think that raises an important point about, you know, discussing with and factoring in family considerations because, you know, that you, and, and certainly as someone who's, who's, worked a lot in moving families around um, that quite often um, an executive will succeed or not succeed based on how happy the family is. So we always have, to have a, a saying like, keep the family happy because if the family is happy, the, the executive will succeed. Yes. No, that's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Case in point, my father. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> three years, I'm been cut in half. Um, so we've talked a lot about gender bias throughout this um, when it comes to hiring practices. What, what, what advice do you have to someone, to a woman trying to select a company that select the right company, over, overcome those, identify those biases, overcome them? 
Um, how should they approach it? You can't hide well, that you're a female the way you can hide your age, you know? So, I mean, I would, that there are two things. I think, I think first of all is that companies need, need to get their acts together and they're not sure. doing that. And one of the things that's going to happen is particularly as women are, um, I mean, all the research says that companies that, that have gender balanced um, teams are, are more effective. So companies that need to get that on board. So for women who are um, looking for opportunities, they should research their company. They should check to see um, if, if it has um, zero tolerance, tolerance on sexual harassment, if it has, um, I mean, good good benefits. I mean, in the States, obviously, you, you have very different situation to you. Sure. Where, where we have um, much more advantageous um, circumstances related to ma- maternity leave and so on. But, but there, are fam- there are family-friendly benefits that favor females in certain companies that other ones don't. Yeah, and I think if, if you're looking for flex, if you're looking for remote working, all of these things that certainly there is a mood at the moment to make sh- to companies to make sure that these are advertised up front because generally women are, are reluctant to ask for them because they feel as though yeah. they're penalized and they are penalized. No, and, and women are, are not good at advocating for themselves. Um, exactly. exactly. I've that. So do, I mean, in terms of being a realist, do your homework and there are ways to identify, ways to find, to identify red flags or companies that where it be a, a good environment. Yeah, and all that information is out, out there. I mean, that that's, you know, there are so many platforms that people can go to to check where companies sit now on the inclusion spectrum. And and particularly with 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 Gen Y and, you know, the upcoming Gen Z as you call it. Mm-hmm. I mean, these these people are really switched on and all the research says is that they will not stay in your company unless you try and accommodate them. So I think it's about finding the balance between self-advocating and companies being more flexible. And are there, do you recommend that, that uh, women ask questions around the topic during interviews? Are there, you know, people are scared to do that. Well, I, I, I would I would advise companies to advertise their benefits because that's a way of attracting people to their brand. So that's the first thing I would do. But for women themselves, I think um, I think that they should. I mean, it, there are two elements here. There's one that is a lifestyle choice based on this mm-hmm. is what I want, and then but for other women. It's what they need. I mean, that they can't function with, without some of the, the benefits that, that companies can choose to offer. Right. So I think that if they can ask, and they can ask in a way that is less confrontational, but to ask, you know, you know how, how, what is your position on? What benefits are you offering? But they have to be they have to be willing to withdraw if it doesn't if it doesn't work for them. And yeah. sometimes yeah. for women that's that's not easy. Particularly if in your location they might the company might be the major employer, for example. Right. Right. No, the options might be limited. So um but I think there are ways of finding out through informational interview, you know, through checking that on That is website, a very good point. Through, yeah. Um checking on Twitter or social media talking to people so there are lots of ways to find out i think that's true that's a very good way to get intel you're right the informational exactly. interviews you'll get things that you would not get from a company exactly. website make sure and, the company and, actually is accurately lives what they say they do exactly and if a company doesn't state up front i think you can assume that um they may not offer but you can also check on pay scale on Glassdoor. Glassdoor, um, mm-hmm. and so you can check. So I think it's about being savvy and doing your research. Yeah, and, and I think you're right. I think um, online research together with speaking to people in the trenches, um, you gather as much intelligence as you can to make those decisions. Especially if that is, if working in a company that that um, 
that is gender gender balance is if that's a deal breaker for you that, that you absolutely want if that's critical you've got to do the homework around it yeah and, and you, you yeah, and, no. and that, that's what I mean about narrowing choice. So if you might think you have unlimited options, but it, if one of your options I is see. in a sector or a company, right, it's not going to accommodate what what you're looking for, then you need to rule them out. It's not really a choice. That's true. Exactly. That's true. Um. So when if you were if someone were, were to say to you, Dorothy, I have five minutes with you, and I am getting ready to go off on my job hunt, what are two, one or two tools that I absolutely cannot live without? What would you say? Two, LinkedIn. Okay. You have a really good LinkedIn profile with a great photo and a nice professional headline, you know, great summary and lovely success stories, not just um, a job description. So, yep. uh, and, and learning how to use that platform it, it, it's fantastic for job seekers. It um, is. It's a database and a, and a place for conversation. And there's no other exactly. platform that gives you that. Yeah. Exactly. Raise your visibility and, you know, uh, engage. Make sure that you're searchable. This is something women don't do. They Their profile is more incomplete than them, their male counterparts. They have less mm-hmm. keywords, less skills listed. So, ladies, you've got to work on that. And... Mm-hmm. The other thing that I would, the other tool, I don't know, does this count as a tool? I would say to network. That counts, yep. Okay. So Shore I, up your I, network, yeah. Yeah. So get out there, get into the workplace, get into, not the workplace, but extend your network um, because still a very high percentage of jobs, introductions are made through referrals and networks. So, you know, go to conferences, go to you know, some of these, not cocktails, but events, different things, and make sure that people know who you are. Raise your visibility. What in Europe, um, and maybe it's country by country, but what percentage of roles would you say are sourced through referrals? I mean, in the U.S., they say it's as high as 60 to 80%. Yeah, I think, I think, it, I think it's the same. About it's, the same? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's very, very high percentage of jobs go through who do you know? And yeah. um, I, I get asked all the time if, if I know someone. So it's, Same. and that's another yeah. thing for women is that ladies recommend another woman because quite often they don't. So really. Oh, that's true. Be your own advocate. That's right. Um, you know, I agree with that. And, um, and to me, it's human nature that jobs get filled through who you know, because as a hiring manager, if I have a role that is needs to be filled my first instinct is not going to be, let me go to HR and fill out a job posting and, and then get it disseminated on LinkedIn. I'm going to say, who do I know? And guys, who do you know that can fill this role? Um, so I think they just happen in tandem a lot. And it's back, it's it's quicker to, to talk to people you know than to go through the process of getting the posting up and, and writing it and all of that. The downside of that is you don't get diverse listings. You don't. No, nope, you, you don't. You, you get mini me's. So, mm-hmm. um, so that's something that you have to factor in is that if you have a diverse network, then you, you can have a diverse referral um, in, intake. But most people tend to network with people like themselves. So I think it's great, but it is a, a contributing factor to uh, non-diverse shortlists, for example. I agree. And I would say then to a caveat to your number two tool network, try, do what you can to make your network diverse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah no, I, I love that. Um, okay, my last question, um, and I'll let you be done for the evening. Um, my favorite question, what is next for you? What can we expect in uh, the rest of 2019 or 2020 for you? Um, well, I'm, st- I'm still working all the time to increase, um, gender balance shortlist. That's always I, at the top of my list and working on that. But I, I'm involved in, in writing, um, a book of the European Union on, um, how to deal with sexism and sexual harassment. So that's something that will come out at the end of the year. And I'm also working on, um, an inclusive workplace um, booklet for um, a, a, 
an organization based locally in Belgium. So they're my two big projects. For wow. Now, the book that you're writing, will that be available for anyone to purchase? Well, it's it's I, it's not going to be for purchase. It, it's it will be distributed within the oh, European through. Union, but I think it will be around and it will be free. So um, I think it's it's commissioned by the European Union. So uh, wow, when I oh, that's it, wonderful. Thank you. I would love that. Perfect. Well, Dorothy, thank you so much. I um, you've got my wheel spinning about um about how to how to better coach my female clients. So thank you so much. No, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for having me. You've been listening to Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco. To learn more about storytelling strategies to catch the eye of today's skim online readers, hiring and decision makers, go to www.virginiafrancoresumes.com. 